that you sit in there. Oh, my own soul. Listen to everybody, everybody say, be everybody else, can't you see?
I meditate for practice. Channel 9 news tell me I'm moving backwards. Eight blacks left, deaf is around the corner. Seven misleading statements by my persona. Six headlights waving in my direction. Five-o asking me, what's in my possession? Yeah, I keep running, jumping the aqueduct, fire hydrants and hazard. The smoke alarms on the back of us, but mama don't cry for me, ride for me, drive for me, live for me, breathe for me, sing for me. Honestly, got in me, I can be more than I gotta be. Stole from me, lied to me, nation hypocrisy, gold on me, driving me wicked. My spirit inspired me, like yeah. Open correctional gates in high desert. Yeah. Open our mind as we cast away oppression. Open the streets and watch our beliefs And when they call my name inside the concrete I pray it for every Freedom, freedom, I can't move Freedom, cut me loose Freedom, freedom, where are you? Cause I need freedom too I break chains up on myself Won't let my freedom ride in hell Hey, I'ma keep on running Cause the winner don't quit on themselves Oh. 
a new dawn, it's a new day, it's a new life for me, yeah, it's a new dawn, it's a new day, it's a new life for me. What y'all know about the make In 1908, Ethel had a vision that would not wait. And for her honor and glory today, we are representing AK. Our history is proud and long. 112 years strong of capturing our vision. And we're doing it with style and flair. All my AKs, throw your biggies in the air and wait. If you're walking round in pink and green, let me hear you holler, Stevie. Our history is proud and loud. 112 years strong, exemplifying excellence. Through sustainable service And we help each other For we know there's no other Like our sister
Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'm Martin Kremers. I serve as Dean of the Mendoza College of Business. I have the distinct honor of welcoming all of you to tonight's very special event, Powerful Conversations with Dr. Dr. Angela Logan and Dr. Glenda Baskin-Glover. <laughs> Conversations is an important word in the title of this exciting new Think and D series. Led by Dr. Logan, Powerful Conversations is an exchange of ideas, an exploration of the importance of race, gender, and faith from the perspective of black female leaders from a variety of backgrounds and fields. This event serves as a terrific opening of a busy weekend around this Saturday's football home stadium opener against the Tigers of Tennessee State University. Welcome, everyone, uh, in particular from Tennessee State University. This, as I think all of you know, this is a historic occasion. The first time in Notre Dame's history that our football team will face a historically black college and university. Yeah. In honor of this historic occasion, we are delighted to have Dr. Baskin-Glover, the president of Tennessee State University, with us tonight. So let's get the conversation started. My role now is to introduce Dr. Logan, who will then introduce um, our distinguished guest. Dr. Angel Logan is an associate teaching professor and the St. Andre Bisset academic director of the Masters of Nonprofit Administration at Notre Dame's Mendoza College of Business. This is actually our oldest graduate business program um, at, at Mendoza. In Angela's role as academic director, she provides leadership to the team that oversees both formats of the Master of Nonprofit Administration degree. Dr. Logan is the first African-American woman to earn a PhD in philanthropic studies from the Indiana University Little Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. Her honors and distinctions include the inaugural Notre Dame Faculty Black Excellence Award and the Mass of Nonprofit Administration Residential Program Outstanding Professor Award. Prior to joining Mendoza College of Business in 2013, Dr. Logan had over 25 years of experience in higher education and philanthropy with a particular focus in the areas of education and diversity. Her research focuses on the intersection of gender, race, and nonprofit and philanthropic leadership. A trained facilitator of anti-racism study circles, she also provides training on leadership, conflict resolution, stress and time management, and cultural sensitivity, both nationally and internationally. She currently serves as president-elect for the Nonprofit Academic Centers Council and is a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Nonprofit Education and Leadership. In her civic life, Dr. Logan serves as chair of the alumni board of the Indiana University Lilly Family School of Philanthropy and is a life member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. She's an active member of South Bend City Church, serving as a senior advisor to the lead and executive pastors and as communion coordinator. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Angela Logan. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Dean Kremers. At this time, before I go any further, I would like to take a moment to thank all of our sponsors. The Mendoza College of Business, the Alumni Association's Think ND, the Office of the Provost, the uh, Office of Institutional Transformation, the Notre Dame Initiative on Race and Resilience, Notre Dame Research, and the Black Alumni of Notre Dame. Thank you. 
Also, thanks you to University Enterprises and Events, the staff at the Morris Inn, the chefs and the bakers, the media specialists and the servers who have lent their talents to bring to life what promises to be a very special evening. And finally, but not last in my heart, a very special thanks to my family, those by birth and those who are chosen, for your unwavering support, prayers, and love. We've laughed until we've cried, we've cried until we've laughed, and you've encouraged me to live inside God's dream for my life, even when life obstructed that view. I love you more than you will ever know. And now let's get started. <laughs> Have you ever wondered what eight months of planning and 20 years of research, dreaming, and prayers could look like? Welcome to Powerful Conversations. An opportunity to begin answering the question Given the demographic estimates that the U.S. will become a majority minority country in at most 23 years, what will the seat of power look like in the future? Through powerful conversations with black women leaders from all walks of life, we will explore a new framework of leadership. And I could think of no better person to start this series than the one and only Dr. Glenda Glover. Who, who serves as the president of Tennessee State University in Nashville, Tennessee. A position she has held since January of 2013. Under her leadership as the university's first female president, TSU has experienced a significant increase in enrollment, alumni fundraising, research dollars, and academic offerings. She is a certified public accountant and attorney and one of only two African-American women to hold the incredible combination of PhD, CPA, JD in the country. As I would do with my students in class, snaps to you. Her employment, oh, clearly my students came because they know <laughs> This is the only way we're getting a little extra credit this week. Mm. Her past employment in also includes high-level positions in the corporate sector, as she is among a very few number of women who has risen to the heights to serve on corporate boards of publicly traded corporations. Currently, she serves as the lead director of the Pinnacle Financial Partners. In 2022, President Joe Biden appointed Dr. Glover to serve as vice chair of the President's Board of Advisors on historically black colleges and universities. Her educational development began as a student of her beloved Tennessee State University. Who was she majored in math? God bless you. <laughs> After earning a bachelor's of science degree, she pursued an MBA from Clark Atlanta, 
then completed her doctorate in business from GW, George Washington, and later completed a law degree from Georgetown. <laughs> and on top of all of that, Dr. Glover is a member of several professional, civic, and nonprofit organizations. The recipient of numerous awards and honors, and most recently receiving the prestigious Thurgood Marshall College Fund Education Leadership Award at the, as the 2018 HBCU President of the Year. President Glover was also named to Essence Magazine's 2019 Woke 100 list <laughs> of influential African American women change agents. Imagine that. And power players that also include First Lady Michelle Obama and Gail King of the CBS Morning News. In 2013, she was named Diverse Issues in Higher Ed's to name to diverse issues in higher ed's prestigious list as one of the top 25 women in higher education. She is also the immediate past international president of the greatest sorority that God could ever create, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. But if I had to venture a guess, I would say her proudest, most precious accomplishments in life are her husband, Charles, their two adult children, adult um, attorney Candace Glover Datcher, and Dr. Charles Glover II. The two of them are the proud grandparents of, um, of Langston Emanuel Datcher, Lincoln Mathis Glover, Everett Miles Glover, and twins Logan and Lena Datcher. <laughs> Good evening, Dr. Glover. <laughs> it is an honor and a privilege to sit here with you, and who could have imagined that random moment in the Atlanta airport oh so many years ago when we were on the tram and I saw this incredibly fabulous wo black woman who looked just amazing and as we were getting off the tram I heard the tiniest little voice say I love your luggage tag and I shook, my, I shook my head a little, I raised my shoulders, I love it, oh my, it's you. <laughs> well then there's that. And in that moment I knew that one day I would have something like this and we would be doing something like this. So thank you. After all the accolades that I just went through, What's one thing that most people would not know about you that's not on your <laughs> impressive bio? What a starter. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I have to tell you in advance that um, for whatever reason, I have a little vertigo tonight and the room is slightly swimming. <laughs> but we're gonna make it. <laughs> the one thing, I, I don't know whether it's known about me or not, but um, it's the fact that uh, the, the daily prayer life that I have embraced. Uh, every morning I have to, I get up at 4.45 um, to be at the campus at six o'clock, sometimes making phone calls as I get ready to Grant Winrow, Debbie, Lolita, they're aware of that. <laughs> And uh, there's a moment of meditation that has to take place. Because leading two organizations uh, for the past four years, up until last summer, that's something you can't do on your own. So you have to start each day with prayer. Lord, I'm going to Alpha Calvary Alpha, I'm going to Tennessee State University. I need you today. <laughs> 
And so, but other than the spiritual side, there's one thing that is almost hilarious, and that is, I just love to study airports. Isn't that odd? <laughs> <laughs> I've sat on two airport boards, you know, as chair of the airport board in Jackson, Mississippi, and a member of the um, Nashville uh, Airport Authority. It just fascinates me. I can be taken off and I see a crack in the runway. I'll email <laughs> <laughs> the CEO and let him know. <laughs> or her know. <laughs> well, I'm sure your study of the South Bend International Airport <laughs> will be a very brief course. Actually, it was beautiful. The beautiful landing. I was watching, I actually was looking at my camera ready to take some pictures, but there were no pictures to take. <laughs> it, so you get an A minus. It, it, <laughs> a minus, is, we will, it's passing, and we appreciate right. that. And I love that you mentioned starting your day with prayer. Um, one of the things that I often say is, if you don't have something to ground you, this work will grind you up. And so being able to pause and reflect, I often um, similarly will get up in the morning. I, my internal alarm clock goes off at about 5.30. And so mm -hmm. I'll just stop. The coffee maker will go on, and it's me, God, and the birds. <laughs> and it's a beautiful way to do it. After 10 years of service, you recently announced your retirement at the end of this academic year. Why now, and what's next? After serving as uh, president of Tennessee State University for nearly 11 years, and after achieving almost all I had set for myself and for the university under my watch I mean, to achieve, we, we accomplished that. And so I realize now that my voice is needed in a much larger platform, um, a, a, a less restrictive platform. Um, <laughs> when you look at what's happening in the world today, the Supreme Court evisceration of the affirmative action, when you look at the cruel conversations going on in Florida, uh, and some others that are having similar conversations, much quieter, but still they're taking place, it makes me know that it's time for uh, voices to be heard and, and for us not just to be leaders, but to become influencers and to be there to, to work in that arena to a much larger uh, space where we're needed. HBCUs are having uh, financial difficulties. They're having problems with collaborations with other uh, entities. And so the voices are needed, and help is needed. And I want to be one of those voices. I also found it interesting that you announced that you were going to retire within, um, after having secured the commencement speaker that you'd been working on for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who don't know, you might have heard of her. She had a small TV show in the Chicago area, and then it got nationally known, and it's Oprah. <laughs> I also found it fascinating that a week after you confirmed speaking with, that you were going to do the Powerful Conversations, you announced your retirement. So that said to me, <laughs> there was nothing else you needed to accomplish but this. <laughs> so TSU, thank you and I am sorry. <laughs> what experiences have anchored you in leadership and what was your earliest experience as a leader? Well, I knew early on after seeing certain things as I was growing up to be the daughter of a civil rights leader comes with a lot of responsibility and a lot of, you see a lot of things you wish you didn't see. And one day, I, one of my friends, 
uh, yeah, when I was much younger, maybe 10, 11, 12, we watched his house burn down because we lived in the county area of Memphis and the fire protection would not allow them to assist certain neighborhoods and we fell on the other side of the track. And so when I saw that, we were all just teary and very emotional because you know, they had fire hydrants and they had the hoses, but that couldn't, that couldn't help. So the next day, my dad led this march downtown for fire protection in our in neighborhoods. And so I went with them. And I was, I, I think I was in the fourth grade, so I must have been eight or so. so and I, I knew then that I wanted to, I didn't know I wanted to be a lawyer, but I wanted to do something that would serve people, that would help the, the neighborhoods and the individuals that needed help the most. So it, it wasn't so much a leader as was watching the leadership and knowing to start developing what I wanted to do, and I knew it was something in the area of service. What did you want to be when you grew up? <laughs> I wanted to be a preacher. <laughs> <laughs> It was 12 in my family, so I said, oh, well, I may as well follow suit, you know. <laughs> but I, actually, I, I thought about being an astronaut. Okay. Because, I, and then as I grew up and I got older and understood uh, more about education, I got to TSU, and I would wonder, you know, what is, well, before I got to Tennessee State, I would ask others, what is the hardest major in the world? I said, I want to do that. And so when my friends were out playing hops, hopscotch or jacks or other you know, pool games, you know, <laughs> I would go to the library and do research on these, what, what is, what is very difficult. So they, and I got to TSU and they said it was math and engineering and physics. I said, okay, I want to do all of those three. And they said, well, you can't get to pick one. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I picked math because you have physics and math. Mm -hmm. I said, great, I can get two hard areas. Oh. And then I said, well, when I graduate, what is the hardest exam we can take? So I went to the library, there was no internet, and researched, and the CPA exam had the lowest pass rate. I researched the bar exam, the med all of them had low pass rates for African Americans, lower. But then the CPA exam was almost nothing. I said, I'm gonna show them how to pass this exam. <laughs> Well, was I mistaken? <laughs> <laughs> it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> and I didn't pass the first time, I didn't pass the second time. <laughs> but I kept at it but till that, I passed it. Yeah. What a picture will you pass? <laughs> oh, I will, I will see your preacher and raise you a doctor and a cheerleader. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think it may have been something to do with the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders, but I'm not sure. And, and now what I say to people is, I've earned my doctorate, mm -hmm. and I'm the biggest cheerleader for the nonprofit sector and God's people you'd ever meet. So there you go. You so it worked. So it worked. <laughs> How do you incorporate your, your cultural identity into your work? And how do you foster an environment where your cultural identity can thrive at TSU? TSU culture is, we're, in, we're HBCU. We're in, we serve largely African-American students. And that's, it's not limited to African-American students, but that's our population primarily. And so we embrace that and we're proud of that. And we seek out to assist those who need it. Because I say I can take any student and make them a scholar. You know? so, so we seek students. You know, we want the top of the line, the top quality students. We want those, the, the top tier talented students. But everybody didn't have a 4.0. You know, some had the high two H, two sevens. We don't leave them behind because we put together a curriculum that will help them and catch them up. And so we have some who are slower than others, but they graduate and they do well. We have done, we, we have, um, not so much studies that are formalized, but we talk to our students, those who have, who started out a little behind, but they caught up and passed, they're doing well, and they're contributing back to Tennessee State. You know? <laughs> One of the things I often joke that I've even taught my father is that at the end of the day, 
It doesn't matter what your role is at an institution. We all work in admissions and development. <laughs> and so a happy student means a happy alum, and a happy alum is a giving alum. <laughs> Let me ask my alum, sister. Man, Absolutely. I'll, first, all TSU alums. All my TSU alum. <laughs> Those who work in, in, in the giving, anything related to institutional advancement, those who raise money in any form or fashion. That's probably all of you again. <laughs> Talita Tony, Grant Winrow, and, uh, Debbie Howard, Rhea, I have the whole, I can't see, everybody who's here, that's their role now. Mm -hmm. So we all are fundraisers. We know we all, uh, everything is about the students. Mm -hmm. So we're here, we're in, we're, you're here another day because of students. Mm -hmm. You can't. If they were to go home, we'd have to go with them because we can't have you know how to serve. So if, if you're not student-centered, mm -hmm. you don't belong in higher education. You don't belong in education at all. If you can't make mm -hmm. the students your priority, and that's say what I do. That's my life. You know? I feel like that's, say that a little louder for the people in the back. If we don't make our students a priority, what are we doing? We have to make sure their lives, mm -hmm. and we want to better their lives. Absolutely. And that's what we're here for. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we take on different roles. I never knew I was such a, you know, a social worker. Because <laughs> they bring in their problems. Mm -hmm. And you sit there and you listen to them and you try to assist. And we have a counseling center, mm -hmm. of course. But you, you take on, you wear different hats. Mm -hmm. Not just as president, but as leaders on the campus. Mm -hmm. That's your role to make sure you ensure the viability of their future. Absolutely. I often joke that if I knew then what I know now, I would have gotten some additional coursework in pastoral care and counseling. <laughs> because that feels like 90% of my job, 5% yeah. administrivia, and then 5% teaching. But that's it. It's about making sure the students feel seen, safe, known, loved, and a part of the family. Yes. Yeah. Do you believe that your professional identity has been influenced by your intersectionality as a black woman? Probably. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if, how so? I'm a black woman. <laughs> that's what I do. I have the, you know, that's who I am. Um, the issues that black women have that others don't have. The issues that black men have that others don't have. Mm -hmm. Issues that white women have. Mm -hmm. It's a white man. I know the cat. I know where I fit. You know, in that square. Mm -hmm. And um, so I embrace that again, and make sure that I know I have to work harder. Mm -hmm. I know I have to work smarter and convince others. But there are some ups and there are some downs. Mm -hmm. So there, and, and, I, and we work through it all because we're leaders and leaders have challenges. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the challenges of, is knowing where you are, who you are, and keeping, staying on, staying on track. You can't let others take you off track. You know, you're gonna have some haters. Mm -hmm. You're gonna have those who are gonna put some stomach blocks in your way. <laughs> You're going to have those who are going to side with opposition against you. But you to keep going. That's why you get up every morning and pray. <laughs> you know, so you can stop that opposition. <laughs> my, as my pastor in grad school used to always say, new levels, new devils. New devils. <laughs> yes, that's right. What advice would you give? To, because there are many students in the room. Most of them are probably mine because I made sure that they were going to come. But what advice would you give to young women entering into the workforce and entering into leadership roles? To work hard, work smart, and don't let anyone outwork you. To, I tell you, I get in at 6 every day. Like I said, every morning I get in at 6. I'm not saying that's what you should embrace. <laughs> but, but you have to do the work. Mm -hmm. You start now. Be competitive, but don't be cutthroat. Mm -hmm. uh, you can be competitive and be in your lane and have your vision developed. Start now. Don't wait until, you know, you say, I'm not sure I'm trying to find myself, you know. <laughs> Start now and do it now. Don't try to get in anybody else's way and to stop anybody else. Stay in your lane and do what you want to do. Do what you're called to. We all have a calling. Mm -hmm. We all have a call to answer. It may not be a Damascus Road call or, or a burning bush call, but we have a call to answer. 
And so answer your call. Stay with what, stay with your vision. Keep going. And again, work with others. You know you have a gift. Your gift will make room for you. You don't have to do anything to hurt, to start, to, to jump start, hurt nobody else. Just do your thing. Work. You have to do the work. Uh, Kamala Harris, Vice President Harris says you must do the work. You have to do the work. And so you have to work hard and, and be competitive, remain competitive. You mentioned earlier that you start your day in prayer and meditation. Uh, how do you, how are you able to balance or integrate your family life, your faith, and your work? <laughs> well, the work day is about 12 hours a day. Um, and you, you get rest and sleep somewhere in between. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Find a meal here and there. <laughs> And then you have to have supportive family. You won't always have supportive family. I do now. I haven't always had the support that I needed. You know, I would, I'll never forget one day I was working hard, studying for the CPA exam. So I asked my husband, can you just watch the, the babies while I'm just going downstairs? I'm just going down to get some form, form to come back up. I heard screaming to the type of a voice, the baby, sorry, what's back upstairs? And I said, what's going on? There's a pillow of his head, his head. I said, what's going on? He said, she was screaming so loud I couldn't hear, I couldn't sleep. <laughs> so, so, so those are the kinds of things, you know, we don't always tell. <laughs> well, I hope he's not listening. You know? <laughs> we don't always tell all the story because mm -hmm. we want it all to be, be pretty and it's not always the beautiful story. Sometimes it's, mm. there are some things that <laughs> you, you laugh yourself through. <laughs> so, but you have to have some support. You have to have a support system. And, and ironically, I'm talking to my husband, his mother-in-law, my mother-in-law, his mother was so special to us because she was so supportive of me. She was an educator. She was so supportive of me. And so when people say, I don't like my mother-in-law, I said, you're kidding me, right? You know, because I love mine. Excellent. What has surprised you the most in your career in leadership? I think the biggest surprise is the level of non-acceptance that black women have to endure. Um, it's not taught in a textbook that you won't always be accepted. You're going to be questioned. There's going to be an asterisk by your name. They're going to look for things to, they're going to try to set you up. They're going to seek out who's your opposition. Then they are partner with your opposition. And that will be their, that will become their source of information. And the opposition is proud because they now are being um, talked to by people who are not, who are in the majority of the population. And they continue to feed information to them just to help to bring you down. So that's the biggest surprise was the fact that you just, no matter all the degrees that you called off, that doesn't matter when there is a, a constructive, uh, systematic effort to bring you down. <laughs> Didn't know we were going to have service tonight, <laughs> Reverend Doctor. May have time to take an offering, have an altar call. No, oh, my, 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 mm. well. well, mm. <laughs> my, my, my. Mm. <laughs> Speaking of money, <laughs> today marks the end of Black Philanthropy Month a global celebration and concerted campaign to elevate black descent giving and funding equity. Most people don't realize that. It's one of the things that I do. It's one of the things that I study. It's change the conversation, change the narrative. We give, we give disproportionately. We give to the things and the organizations that matter most to us. During your tenure as the international president of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, one of your initiatives that I absolutely loved 
was HBCU for life. And part of the reason why I loved that is when, in your, um, when you rolled out your platform, you, you asked the audience to stand. And it was not just if you were an alum, uh, I mean, if you were graduated from an HBCU, or if you sent your children to an HBCU, but if it was if your parents went and I stood proudly because my mother was a proud alumna of Alabama State University. And then you said, if your heart and your wallet have been to an HBCU. <laughs> and I let out a sigh as an actively engaged godparent of two whose money went to Spelman and goes to Hampton. <laughs> And then you said what was also my favorite, if you partied at an HBCU. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's that about that. And as a result of that initiative, you, initi you created the HBCU Impact Days, where we were asked to give a million dollars a day, a million dollars in one day. And the first time that it I was like, ooh, I don't know, Madam President. Surprised me. <laughs> Mustard seed faith. That's that faith. So the first year was one million. The first year was a million. One point two. One point two. The second year was one point one. Uh huh. Third year. One point four. And then the last year, two point three. <laughs> and, and remind me again that last year was in twenty. 20, it, my term ended 2022, uh -huh. so it was that fall of 2021. Well, fall of 2021. Everybody remember where we were fall of 21? Yeah. 2.1, 2.1? 2.3 well, million dollars. That was just, um, as, as a college president, I see firsthand the needs of HBCUs. When we were getting together, the team was together saying, let's, let's define the agenda of HBCUs. So someone recommended um, an awareness campaign. I said, awareness? <laughs> we don't need awareness. Everybody's aware of HBCUs. Right. We need, they need money. <laughs> so let's let's mm. do something that can raise money for HBCUs. Mm -hmm. So I got this brilliant idea. And I got it one morning early, dropped in my spirit, a million dollars in one day. <laughs> so I started talking back to it. <laughs> <laughs> As we tend to do. <laughs> and so it became a possibility in my mind. Mm -hmm. So we said, well, the Divine Nine organizations take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. There are nine organizations that I'm aware of. And that's the Divine Nine. But we don't go begging to others to help take care of us. We're a membership organization. Mm -hmm. So if we can do that, we can raise a million dollars. I've never heard of us going hand in hand with someone saying, pay our bills for us. We go to each other. We take care of each other. You know, my good friend, uh, Beverly Smith, who's an, uh, the former international president of Delta Sigma Theta, we sat there and talked about how we take care of ourselves, and we don't talk that enough in the, as members of the Divine Nine. So we said, we can do a million dollars in a day. So, because I know that this, HBCUs need that money, and, and, and it was for an endowment, not just to give scholarships at one time, but endowments represent sustainability. Mm. And so we want an endowment on every campus, every college campus. I just want to float the idea to others in the Divine Nine. And so, you know, we, we still talk through it now, but I, want, I jumped ahead and just did it. Mm. So, <laughs> so we did it, and so all together, other than just the HBCU day, mm -hmm. we had the chapters doing things, mm -hmm. giving scholarships on their own, mm -hmm. and so through the foundation some. And so the total was about $25 million mm -hmm. in that four-year period. Mm -hmm. So that was nothing. Yeah, let's clap on that one. <laughs> <laughs> so so every, every HBCU has an endowment now. So we did $100,000 each one. There was some, I think three of, a handful got 75000 the, you know, the spell most of more houses, the one you give your money to, you're helping them, they don't need, to, they need as much, you know. <laughs> but most of them got $100,000. And so we thought we were very proud of that initiative. And, um, 
And HDCU is a, we need sustainability. There's money that's needed. We need two things. We need money. Yeah, of course, that's, everybody knows funding. You would ask me the biggest challenge are HBCUs. It may be on your list. I don't know. But the biggest challenge is not necessarily the funding. The biggest challenge that we have is that we need the advocacy base. We need advocates. Not so much alumni advocates, but others who can walk the halls of Congress and the state capitals and others and, and sell the HBCU story, tell our own story. Because the funding will come if you have the right adv advocacy program. And that's what we're, we're missing in our, in our colleges and universities, our HBCUs. And, not our, and sometimes in the, in the, in the smaller non-HBCUs, we're missing that. We need the advocacy. And then we have to the, always start by defining who we are and why we exist. You know, that's, that was another surprise, that you can't start a decent conversation about HBCUs without first having to back up and say who we are. We were founded of the newly free slaves. Go through all of that, then they wonder, why are you still in existence? You know, so once you, you get past that, the interview is almost over, you know, so. <laughs> but that's, that's the difference in HBCUs and non-HBCUs. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What have been your bright spots, which are things black female leaders can see that leaders from other back backgrounds might not see? And what are, your some, what are some blind spots? So things that we miss that others will pick up. I think some of the bright spots well, as it relates to Tennessee State, I think the national branding mm -hmm. of TSU. I think we're on this national stage. Mm -hmm. This is an HBCUs on this national stage. This is an HBCU renaissance. You know, the students are coming back to HBCUs, and we're proud about that. So we have to make sure that we're ready to receive them, mm -hmm. the adequate programs they need to succeed, to be competitive in a global marketplace. We have to make sure we embrace them, no matter you know if they're from one side of the track or the other side of the track. They're ready to excel and go out and be great. So I think we miss that sometimes mm -hmm. in our conversation. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the bright spots. It's, it's both. It's, know, both. So. it's a both hand, <laughs> absolutely. It's making sure that, the, that all of our kids have the access and the opportunity to succeed because that's all they need. They just, sometimes they just need a chance. The opportunity. Just need an opportunity. Somebody who believes in them especially when they don't believe in themselves. Yes. And that's what we all need on any given day. Somebody who can see the best in you when you see the worst in you. Because I know me, and I, <laughs> I don't like me most days. So what, is a, what does a typical day look like for you? We, we you started, sure? I know, Are we you started. Sure you want me to answer that question? I know, yes. <laughs> just, okay, it's, what was yesterday like? Yesterday was probably typical. Okay, let's, let's do today and go back to the yesterday. Okay, let's do today. <laughs> today involved getting up at 3 o'clock to get a 6 o'clock flight to connect to Atlanta to get here. To the internet, the South Bend International South Bend International <laughs> Airport. <laughs> to this, this, and come to, to South Bend <laughs> and be met with, I mean, just, it's so welcoming. It was, it's such a, a friendly city. <laughs> and. The people just smile. They say good morning, you know. So, like, <laughs> and I, and I met some of my friends. We had lunch at this place called Pegs. Oh yes, Pegs. Mm. Yes, it was very good. It's a South Bend institution. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then I was trying to get just a moment of rest, mm. but the phone kept ringing because it's registration it's for classes. It's the last day, so now I'll go back to yesterday. <laughs> I met with, you know, the first two weeks of school, I completely shut down and just worked with students, trying to get them back in school, help them find money, talk to parents. Sometimes parents are uh, a little upset over different things because um, they want what they want. And it's hard to say, well, I'm really sorry, it's going to take a little bit more money <laughs> than what you, want to, what you want to put out. And, and you have to really have an even temper, temperament. And so when you get these conversations, I know yesterday, if you ask, I just said to a parent, peace be still. Mm. <laughs> Take a moment. We got it. 
Got this. Gotta bring it back down a notch. Peace, be still. So <laughs> we got it taken care of. So that's what this, this last two weeks were about, just getting students back in school, that class schedule. We have a lot of uh, freshmen, first-time freshmen. Uh, last year we had uh, 3,500 first-time freshmen, mm -hmm. which is a, 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 an amazing number for an HBCU, the highest of any HBCU. Of course, you know, the legislature and I had some conversations about that because we didn't have enough housing for all of them. We don't have housing because we don't have the money that's owed to us by the legislature. And I won't go on that one because they may be listening. I can't fight them anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I've given up on fighting them now. I let my enemies fight them for me. <laughs> don't know they'll fight. They don't know they have to be where they are. And so I just said, we will just meet with the students all this week, get them straight. And that's what we do. That's what I've done for the last two weeks. And so started, starting on Tuesday, I get back to my normal routine. <laughs> normal routine, yes. yes. I love that. And it, it, again, the preacher line, the pastoral care and counseling, it's, it's emerging, whether you know it or not. <laughs> These first couple of weeks, it's getting them in and letting them know that this was the right place to be. It is. This is the it best is. place in the world that you could be. We've got you. We love you. We're going to get through. We're going to take care of you. We're going to take care of you. If you we trust had one me. student who came yesterday for the first time. Mm. She had lost her mother mm. two weeks ago, mm. so she was late starting. Mm -hmm. And she was going to go to another, to a community college. Mm -hmm. Then she decided she wanted to come to Tennessee State. And so, you know, we've had, they missed three class periods mm -hmm. already. Mm -hmm. So we just sit there and think about, she just lost her mom. Mm -hmm. So do we really say, you may not be able to catch us. So we pulled her, I pulled her transfer personally. So she had an over four point GPA from high school, made it in the high 20s on ACT. I said, I think she can, we're, we're gonna sign her mm -hmm. a tutor to just get her caught up. Mm -hmm. She's gonna be great. So. She's gonna be amazing. <laughs> and what a story she'll be able to tell. Yes. About how you all became the family when she needed it the most. What's the best advice you've ever received? Treat people the way you want to be treated. Mm. Mm -hmm. I love that. And fight for what's right, even if you fight alone. Mm. That came from my dad. Mm -hmm. The first came from my mother. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the mm -hmm. second part came from my dad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Both of my parents, uh, trust, every trust everyone, but get a receipt. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> that was from my mother. Mm -hmm. And what did your father say? Um, whatever you do, commit to it fully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other thing my mother always taught me was to be curious and to be kind. And you can get more with a smile. Mm -hmm. People say, why are you always smiling? I said, God has been good to me. <laughs> <laughs> so I have no reason to frown. I have no right. Mm -hmm. Even when you're frowning within, mm -hmm. you must smile on the outside. You must smile on the outside. You know, keep yeah. that face, you know, mm -hmm. because you may be helping someone get through something. Mm -hmm. If they see you all bunched up and crying, and then, then you may not be the inspiration they need at that Absolutely. moment. So try to always smile and help somebody else. Because mm -hmm. a smile is, 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 is helpful. It's like laughter is a healer. Mm -hmm. Smile is a healer. Mm -hmm. I think you actually lose weight when you laugh. So <laughs> at least that's what I told my doctor. I don't know. She didn't really believe me, but. Well, let's start a laughing campaign. There right we go. <laughs> Mind, body, wellness. We're all going to laugh together. We chose Sankofa as the symbol for this series, which is a bird um, sim um, from the Twi language in Ghana. And it loosely is translated as, it is not taboo to go back and retrieve what was lost. Go back and get it. How does this play a role in your leadership style? Go back and get it. When I saw that, I see the bird is looking backwards, getting egg or ball, I'm not sure. But it's saying to me that um, you have to look back to make sure you don't repeat any mistakes you made and to be ready to embrace and correct anything that may have happened that uh, you wouldn't want to repeat. Um, you can't forget your history. You know that's why it's so painful to hear the 
the distortions of history in Florida about slavery being beneficial and, and those kinds of idiotic, idiotic conversations. But it says you remember the struggles of your ancestors and to make sure that you gain, you learn from, you gain from what they went through. You learn from that. And you're never going to repeat that awful past. But you have to look back at that past to know how to prepare for the future <coughs> and to make sure you have a bright future. And in my case with students, make sure you ensure they have, they have the brightest future that's possible for them. Absolutely. A um, few year, my, um, years ago, I was having a struggle with the general state of the world, and my father said to me, we're gonna be okay. And I really thought that he had just was on his way out. I was like, sir, what are you talking about? And he was like, no, we'll be okay. There was a time in this country when we were poor, and we knew we were poor. We had no education, we had no health care, but we figured out how to survive. And when opportunities were afforded to us, we took advantage of every one of them, and we set your generation up to succeed. But the one thing we forgot to do was teach you a little resilience skills. But that, that's easy. <laughs> okay. And because my father taught, um, I'm an only child, and I've learned a lot of sports, I immediately went to, put me in, coach. I'm ready to play. <laughs> and so, sometimes you just got to brush yourself off. Like that because mm -hmm. you have to be in the game. In the you mm -hmm. can't be even on the 50 yard line. Mm -hmm. You have to be in the game, mm -hmm. playing the game. Mm -hmm. Because a spectator, this is not a, this is not a spectator sport. We're in this. We're playing a game. It's, it's, and it's a game you must always be prepared. Because somebody, you got the offense and defense mm -hmm. in football. Cool. And somebody mm -hmm. is always there. Mm -hmm. If you're the offense, the defense there after you. If you're mm -hmm. defense, you gotta watch out. I mean, you have to always be there mm -hmm. and know what the next move is. My dad taught me football. Same. I, I didn't like that because <laughs> on Sunday afternoons, who wants to sit with their father when you were seven or eight, well, eight or nine years old? <laughs> He's explaining to you about football. I said, oh my God. That's a, <laughs> he said, I watch this. Watch this. going to be a quarterback sneak. And I'm just saying, if I could just ease out this door now, <laughs> maybe you won't miss me. But it had a silver lining. Mm -hmm. I would go to school. I'm the only girl who knew about football. All the boys would be around me, listen to me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dad. <laughs> In a moment, we're gonna open up the floor for questions, but before I do, I would like to take a moment to again acknowledge our appreciation to the board of the Black Alumni of Notre Dame who are with us tonight. Mm -hmm. Inviting Dr. Glover to be here in person rather than virtually, which is how this podcast typically will go, was actually their idea. So we are grateful for their idea and their request. Will you please stand and be recognized? <laughs> yeah. I would also like to ask the black women of the alumni board to remain standing as we celebrate black female leadership tonight with Dr. Glover, who, as I mentioned in the intro, holds not one, <laughs> not two, but three advanced degrees. With, will all the black women in the room who hold advanced degrees stand to be recognized and celebrated? who are working on advanced degrees. And who is here, I know I saw some of my babies who are working on their advanced degrees. 
Don't make me call y'all out. They Mm -hmm. and others who may want a change, want HBCU world, I have just the school for you. <laughs> <laughs> for those of you who have a question, I invite you to come to one of the microphones in the room on either side so we can hear and we will try to answer as many questions as time allows. Don't be shy. You can do it. I believe in you. Excellent. It's all you. Yep, it's all you, sis. Somebody was coming back here with me, okay? <laughs> uh, first of all, um, I would like to say thank you, Dr. Logan, for your amazing questions that you've been asking. Um, and to Dr. Glover, thank you for being here. My name is Tiffany Russell. I'm a counselor at the Counseling Center here at the University of Notre Dame. Um, I want to first thank you for this conversation. Um, I recently enrolled at a HBCU um, to complete my doctorate degree in this conversation. Thank you. Um, and this conversation, seeing you both up there, really just affirmed my decision. And so I'm just so grateful to be in this space with you all. Um, you kind of addressed um, part of my question earlier when you were talking about um, the struggles that we have as black women um, as we are trying to make our way into leadership positions. I just want to know if you could say a little bit more about how you handle the systemic barriers that are often um, really feel impossible to get past as we, we see the need for change, um, have a heart for change, want to be a change agent in some of these places, how you would suggest that we continue to do that when the task sometimes seems impossible. Very good. You, you have to confront it head on, but not to be antagonistic about it, but to be in a peaceful space. You know, make it known that you were offended by something that was said uh, or that you felt that you're not being fully appreciated and you like to show more what your, what you, your skill set, what you bring to the table. Sometimes um, it's not known what we can really do. And so we have to let people know, look, we're, my, my ability, my capability includes this. So I like to be considered for that. Um, but I always say keep it as peaceful as possible. Mm -hmm. You can't win a shouting war. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen. <laughs> so sometimes we can't control it <laughs> as much as we try to. Mm -hmm. But it's just make it, let it be known that there's some disagreement. Just dis be disagreeable. But a disagree would not be disagreeable. That's my, my recommendation. Two things I would add. One is, as I said at the beginning, if you don't have something to ground you, this work will grind you up. If you don't have something to ground you, this work will grind you up. And the other thing that I'm often reminded of is the fact that my four grandparents I had one grandfather who was a dirt farmer in Hope Hull, Alabama. I had a grandfather who worked in the steel mills in, in Western Pennsylvania. And my grandmothers were the help. Between the, t between the four of them, they had 24 children. I say on a good day, I can name all my aunts and uncles, and on a really good day, I can put them in birth order. I have very few of those good days, but what that, when I explained that to someone, they said, oh, that's where you get your work ethic. And it reminded me of two very important things. It's not ego or vanity, but I'm smarter than most people realize, and I'll outwork you. And those two 
with something that will ground me, I'm an unstoppable force. Mm. And game recognize game. Yes. And you looking real familiar, boo. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Glover and Dr. Logan, thank you. The ancestors have put us together and we are standing on your shoulders and realizing the brilliance of the space in this room, so thank you for that. My question to you, Dr. Glover, is if you could go back to little Dr. Glover, now that you know what you know, what would you tell her that might change or not change what she thinks about who she will become. Uh, if I had to do all over, start all over, I tell you one thing I would have done, I would have trusted God sooner. I would <laughs> 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 I, mean, I wouldn't have stayed up nights worrying about certain things. Mm. I would have just put the trust where the trust belongs. Um, I, I wouldn't worry about bills and, and just things that were in his hand. I would have trusted him much sooner in life. Although I was in church all my life, but it's the difference in being in church and really trusting God to be the, the sole leader in your life. And so I would, have, I would tell my younger self to, you know, Eat those words. Let them become a part of you. And then live them uh, from the this early part of your remembrance up until now. Doctors, thank you so much for sharing your life and your time with us. My name is Maria Nakalanda. I am from Uganda. I'm a current student of esteem. It's engineering, science, technology, entrepreneurship, and innovation masters at the University of Notre Dame. The funny thing is, <laughs> it's funny how I had to come up with a second question because my first question was slightly related to hers. And probably you've discussed this a while earlier. When we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, I sometimes feel like it's one-sided in a way that we do not embrace fully the fact that everyone has something to offer on this table. So it's a conversation that I get to with a kind of sticky approach because I feel like at the end of the day, it's always bent towards a certain level. So my question is, what has been your experience with imposter syndrome? And tell us about a time when it hit so bad and what you do about it. Thank you. Imposter syndrome. The imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome. Oh. <laughs> Nobody's tried to first name me. <laughs> um, feeling inadequate or feeling that you're not ready for the room or all the things, the, the voice and the... the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are days when you do feel inadequate. One does feel inadequate. Um, I know one day I was about to do, deliver a speech to a major audience, and it was, I mean, two or 3,000 people that I'm saying, Lord, I feel so insufficient, you know. And, Come to my, his voice came back to my spirit. You may be insufficient, but I am sufficient. <laughs> and and you have to say a prayer before you get up and do anything. I you know I, I don't want to overstate that, but I do. Yes, I do. <laughs> but there are times, even so, you feel like you may be in the wrong room, but you have to study to make sure you know what you're talking about especially in some of the circles you're going to find yourselves, in some of the rooms you're going to be in, some of the conversations they'll ask you to participate. So just, you have to know the subject matter. You don't have to be a subject matter expert, but always, if you don't know, don't try to fake it. 
Just say, I'm not sure about that one. And let me research and get back to you. But the worst thing you can do is give a false answer, mm-hmm. especially one of us. <laughs> Because they would just, they would put that in the paper. That's all they would say. <laughs> Glover said, but we fact-checked her. <laughs> and it was not five, it was 4.6. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> the one thing that I would add to that is make sure that you have a circle that will cheer for you when you've lost your voice. Perhaps you had a dream for 20 years and you started planning for eight months and 30 minutes before it happened, you started freaking out. (laughs) But you get you some good people in your life who will walk with you and who will pray for you and who will see it when you can't see it for yourself and you get a couple of those, you can move mountains. Uh, This may come as a surprise, but I'm neither black nor a woman. Um, (laughs) But your voice matters. (laughs) Thank you, thank you, thank you. Your question matters. Um, And what you are about to ask is going to change the world. I need a few more minutes then, if that's the case. But what does it look like for the non-black people in the room to be an ally, to be a partner, and to be a megaphone for the work that you're doing? First of all, the fact that you asked the question, I don't know if you caught the love that you got right there. You got love and snaps because being, I don't necessarily need an ally as much as I need what the late great gentleman from from the glorious state of Georgia, John Lewis used to say, I need some accomplices to get some accomplices and some co-conspirators who will get into some good trouble and some necessary trouble. You're going to be in rooms that I will never be in. So it is your responsibility in that room to make sure that I not only have a seat at the table, but you back my play. Because I promise you, Girl Scouts honor on my 20 pearls, I will not embarrass you. I just need to get, as the great Lynn Manuel, Manuel, Man, Lynn Miranda, whatever his name is, said, <laughs> I just need to be in the room where it happens. <laughs> And that, my friend, is how you become an accomplice. <laughs> you know, and as, as you get into the room, as you're in the room, invite others to the room with you, to the table. Because many times it's not known what can come out of our mouths and the things that, the capacity that we, that we bring. And so for you to embrace a question in that manner. Or you, you could love you. <laughs> you we felt this, we saw the smile. You, you could have the feeling that you would ask, what can I do? You know, what you can do is, is, is the partnerships, the relationships. Uh, like right now, this relationship that we've established with Notre Dame, this is amazing. Because you know, we, this is a history making for TSU. Mm-hmm. You know, and this history making for you. So it, it, that's what we're doing. We're proud that we're making that kind of history. But it takes people like you to come to the table. What does Shirley Chisholm say? If you're not invited to the table, there's no seat for the table, bring a folding chair. You know? <laughs> that's a, but not, 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 probably not a folding chair. <laughs> <laughs> Well, she said a chair. She said folding. Or, or maybe a folding chair. It depends. 
It depends. But we appreciate that. But that's what that's what happens. And then it may not be it may not happen with all of us together, but you could talk to one or two of us and start like that. You start in a smaller circle and then it grows and it grows and pretty soon you have the whole room. You know, it's part of your circle tonight. Hi, doctors. My name is Ezequias Galleros. I am a local senior in a South Bend High School here. Come on, no. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> My sister is actually in your class. She's over there. She invited me here. <laughs> so I was like, I'm most definitely coming. <laughs> and I would just, first of all, I'd like to applaud you and thank you for using your platform as a voice to just give glory to God in everything that he's doing in this community and he has done in your life. I take that as a great honor to be here today to hear your testimonies in every single sentence that you speak. So my question today is, when and while you were doing this journey that you call life, that you have, and all of these amazing accomplishments that you have, how did you learn to put God first beyond all? No matter how much stress you were going over, no matter what was going on in your life, how did you learn who taught you and what led you to who you are today? Thank you. Wow. Thank you. That's wonderful. Oh, there it is. That's wonderful. Sweet baby. Growing up with a family of 12 ministers, they were Pentecostal, they were Baptist, they were Methodist, but they were all, they all had this common thing. You must read the scriptures daily before we could eat. You know how you all had to say a scripture? We didn't say a chapter. We did. And we said, what chapter are you going to do today? Well, I didn't learn the whole chapter, then and we'll come back to you. Well, it doesn't mean I don't eat, you know. <laughs> but, uh, so you, you, you say a few verses. You couldn't just get away with one verse. And so I made a point to just go through the Bible, just read. And so as you read, you get strength, and you get the, the faith that you need. It's all based on your faith. You talk about prayer life, but it's all based on faith. You put that faith and prayer together, you can't go wrong. But it was early on, because you know you had to get baptized and 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 grow into the, the, the grow into the word, as I would say. So is I'm so happy we can talk about we can talk like this, you know, that you're not one of the places where you just shield it, you just squash it, quench it, you know. But I really appreciate that question because everybody here, I, I, I can probably most people here have a prayer life and a faith life. They don't have a chance to talk about it in a national forum all the time. But it's okay to let people know where you stand on issues, especially if they pertain to religion, if they pertain to things that are, that are, that are special to you. It can be advocacy, advocacy, it can be social issues, social it can be voting. But let people know that you have a, you take a stand on issues that are, that are important to you and to the population that we serve. Uh, simil similar. So I um, had a weekday faith and a weekend faith. What that means is I went through 13 years of Catholic school education, but I'm not Catholic. I actually said that's, but hey, I know Latin mass, I know Slovak, I can say, sing the hymn for the Feast of St. Nicholas, I know pierogies, I know fish on Fridays. <laughs> And yet, on the weekends, I had a good Church of God faith where my great uncle was the founding pastor of the church. My mother was in the choir. My grandmother was second row. I had to, and you better not sit in her seat on the second row. And so I learned early the importance of faith. And when you have a weekend faith and a weekday faith that didn't always agree, or a line, or use the same Bible, you had to, as my mother always taught me, in all you're getting, get an understanding. And so I learned how to deconstruct and reconstruct my faith as a five-year-old. And it just kept growing and growing. And the more I learned, the more questions I had, and the more questions I had, the more answers I got, and I kept pushing and pulling, 
and it got a little rough and it got a little raggedy, <laughs> but I learned that I had to have something to ground me. And that was it. And it's funny that you mentioned about being in a place where you can talk about faith. Yeah. I used one of, the, one of my examples, I actually used it in class earlier this week. We were talking about nonprofit boards and my students asked, what's an ideal size for a board? And it's my favorite thing to say and they're chuckling already. I was like, well, Jesus had 12 <laughs> and it worked okay. He was the 13th member of his board. He had to replace a board member for <laughs> obvious reasons because sometimes boards have to have members replaced and he had an advisory board of Mary, Martha and the other Mary. So it's a good model, it works. I can't get away with that at other institutions. <laughs> and, and sometimes, speaking of boards and, and your circle, be careful who you let in your circle. Mm. Jesus had 12 disciples, one of them was a devil. So you have to be careful who you let in your circle and just keep note of what happens to the people in your circle. It's really important. You don't want to exclude anybody because of any discriminatory aspect. But just know that you're always watching what goes on. And, and sometimes in your circle, there, there's not always going to be roses and lovey-dovey. Because remember, there was a time when there was some fighting among the disciples. Who's the greatest? Who's going to sit on the right hand? Who's going to sit on the left hand? And even Jesus himself got mad in church once and beat some folk out. <laughs> in, my, in my profession, that's called assault and battery. You know? <laughs> so your circle is important, your circle of friends, your, your, your board members, your circle, that's important. Just always keep, keep an eye on your circle, your inner, your inner circle. Thank you so much, Dr. Glover. Before Dr. Glover and I adjourn for the evening and yeah. join you all for coffee and conversation, we have time for one more? Okay, one more? okay, we have time for one more. You two fight it out. You three fight it out. <laughs> Hi, um, I just wanted to say thank you for creating sorry, the space where these conversations are welcomed and for having us all here today. I'm Aliyah Applin. I'm a freshman at the University of Notre Dame studying in strategic management. Um, so my question was, what do you hope to see in the future of young black women as you have obviously paved the way? What do you want us to do with the mantle that you've laid before us? My eldest godchild is a 3L at Yale, proud alumna of Spelman. <laughs> and uh, it broke my heart the other day to learn that she's fighting some of the same battles that I had to fight. And so my hope and my prayer for you and for her and all the girls that are coming after you is that you don't have to fight the same battles that we have to fight. We've taken far too many blows for you to have to do, as the psalmist Whitney Houston sang, same script, different cast. If we can find a way to give you the resilience and the strength and the power to challenge and to speak truth to power, baby, the kids are gonna be all right. <laughs> and I have similar advice. That is, sometimes you may have to stand alone, but you must always stand for what is right. And accept criticisms because you're going to get it even if you do your absolute best and you know that you're right you're going to be criticized but understand that's just a part of the growth and development of a young mind and the young building your capacity developing who you are and embrace it and never ever ever be ashamed of anything about your who you are any demographic that represents you that's who you are. Uh, and, and, and as we said, we don't want you to be in the world that we frowned upon from the past, but it's coming back again. It's, it's, a, it's a circle that's coming back. Just in Jacksonville, you, people got killed just for being black. 
You know, I mean, how, I mean, how scary is that? How unbelievable is that? So keep your eyes open, you know, keep your heart open, you know, keep your heart fixed in the right direction, and, and you'll be successful, you know, to come to a microphone in a room, crowded room, to have the courage to ask a question, you know, just have the boldness and the competitive spirit and the work ethic and the integrity will always never compromise your integrity. There's nothing more important than your name and your integrity. Before Dr. Glover and I adjourn with all of you to, into the foyer for coffee and conversation, thank you again for joining us, Dr. Glover. You will always be welcome at Our Ladies University. It has been an honor, a, a pleasure, and the true joy of my life. <laughs> Can we show Dr. Glover a little Irish love? has been an evening we won't soon forget. Thank you all for being here, and go Irish. Yeah. <laughs>